Good morning. My name is Tom Reed, and I will be talking to you today about using the Freedmen's Bureau to find your ancestors. I'm thankful to Family Tree University for the opportunity to talk about this topic, as I've been very closely involved with the Freedmen's Bureau project and these records for almost the last two years. I uh, just want to introduce myself again, Tom Reed. I'm the marketing manager for Family Search International, the largest family history organization in the world. And I focus on African-American outreach. Therefore, I've gotten involved with the Freedmen's Bureau Project. And in this presentation today, uh, we'll talk about what was the Freedmen's Bureau, what records were kept during the operation of the Bureau, what was the Freedmen's Bureau Project, as opposed to the Freedmen's Bureau, and how we can use the Freedmen's Bureau records for genealogical research. So let's jump right into it with the story. Let me tell you my personal story. This is my family. Back in 2006, we had a family reunion in Bloomington, Illinois, where I'm originally from. And we were there meeting under the Baines family. The woman pictured here is Ruby Baines. She, at the time, was the oldest child of Tom and Elizabeth Baines. My, she's basically Ruby's my great aunt, my, my father's mother's sister. <laughs> um, and so we met for the Baines family, and that's when I kind of, I say, caught the genealogy bug, if you will, um, where I was really interested. I wanted to learn more about my family. And so I went online, and I found this picture of my great-grandfather, her father, Ruby's father, my, my grandmother's father. His name is Tom Baines, like me. So I love the name Tom Baines. Handsome fellow, isn't he? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and as I did research and, and looked into his family, I actually found in the 1870 census a record for his father, whose name was, almost, was also Thomas Baines in the household of Rose Baines. So it was very exciting to be able to trace this family line that I really knew nothing about all the way back to the 1870 U.S. Census. And I actually, uh, as I started the Freedmen's Bureau Project, which we'll talk about a little bit more, had the opportunity to be interviewed by Time Magazine. And they put this story and this picture of my grandfather online because I couldn't go any further. I hit that what's called the, the 1870 brick wall for African American research. Um, it's, it's a typical place where it was the first time that African Americans were um, documented as citizens on the U.S. Census, and for many of us, that's as far as the records go. And so, you know, as I looked, I continued to look in records. I, you can see here I found some additional records thanks to the Freedmen's Bureau Project. And here's actually um, a payment of bounties um, that was during the time of the Freedmen's Bureau. And this is an additional record that I found that will kind of talk about how I found this record thanks to the Freedmen's Bureau Project and how you might be able to find records similar to this as well. So let's go, let's get into it. So let's, let's talk about what was the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau was formed as an, by an act of Congress at the end of the Civil War in 1865. The Freedmen's Bureau, also known as, well, the official name was the Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands. This organization provided support for newly freed African Americans and poor white Southerners. With all the support came the first records for a new group of U.S. citizens. And so right after the Civil War, between 1865 and 1872, this organization existed in 15 states in the District of Columbia. And they did as, as um, blacks went into uh, army camps and, and Union Army camps and became refugees technically. They needed support. They needed help. And President Lincoln had, was very concerned, and so he organized this organization called the Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands. They were tasked really with operating these refugee camps that were starting in contraband camps that were popping up all over the, the, the North and even in the South. Um, they opened schools, so for the first time, these uh, African Americans specifically and, and those who in the South or had the opportunity for educational for education and therefore they opened schools for them they solemnized marriages they um, actually you know for the first time people were actually able to be 
um, sealed in holy matrimony. Uh, and, and it was documented by the state and by clergy, uh, all these marriages and, and family relationships. In addition, they formalized labor contracts. So now uh, those who they would maybe been enslaved to were forced to pay them labor for their labor and for wages. And so the Bureau helped them put together labor contracts. They managed hospitals for the first time. They were getting um, decent medical care. I mean, at least had some kind of attention to medical care. And there were records that were kept on medical care as well. And that kind of leads us to the next topic of what records were kept during the operation of the Bureau. Well, there were lots of records, lots of correspondence. In fact, uh, it, this record group uh, is housed at the National Archives. The National Archives is who actually preserved these records um, from the time of, well, its inception as the National Archives till today. And it is known in the National Archives as Record Group 105 or RG 105. So if you ever go to the National Archives and you want to actually see the records for yourself and actually touch them and, and what have you, the best thing to do is to go and ask for Record Group 105, which is the Bureau of Freedmen, um, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands, or the Freedmen's Bureau. In this collection of documents are over 1.5 million digital images. And I, I thank the National Archives for the efforts that they took to actually preserve all these documents and make them available to us today. Um, they made available to us things like this labor contract here. You'll see this is an agreement made um, between two individuals to cultivate and pick, it looks like, um, four acres of cotton on said plantation. I mean, it's just spelled out so much um, in this document, the labor contract and, and what was required of the laborer and the employer now. There are things like ration records. So here are, you know, there were many who were displaced. They didn't have any food. They didn't have any clothing. They would come to the bureau and appeal for rations. And so here you have these families that are listed and the number of men and women and children and number of days that they needed rations for and therefore the number of rations that they received. You know, this is for many the first time that their names have been documented in these records is like in this ration record, for example. You have education records. So you have teachers who were with the American Missionary Association who came down to the South to educate these former, formerly enslaved individuals, now free, uh, and they actually took records. For example, you see here in Savannah, there was 1,500 children that should attend school, schools mostly in charge of AMA. So here you have some details about what was going on in the schools that time. This record doesn't necessarily list the children that were in school or the educational records, but some do. Um, again, this is just one type of educational record that was available. There are also claim records. So now here's a bounty, a claim to be paid um, that, you know, they might receive some funds for things that they've done or, or what have you. And so there was documentation. And you see here the formal name of the Bureau, Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, Office Bounty Dispersing Agent, January 21st, 1869. And there's all kinds of documents and, and correspondence like this claim record. Record of complaints, you know, when there were things egregious, uh, things that were done egregiously uh, against the freedmen or the refugees or, or those whose lands had been confiscated and they needed to form a formal complaint. They, they went through and you see here's the, the complainant, the, the defendant's name, where the location and the evidence and, and sometimes the outcome of that case are in some of these complaints. These are rich documents that tell a very unique uh, story of American history that maybe you would never read or see before until you really got into these documents. And so it's very interesting, uh, you know, how you get when you get into these documents to see what they reveal and what they tell about the time period. It's amazing. Some of them are, are, are touching and, and gripping very much so, but, but you know, it, it's still a part of our history and things that we need to know, and, and we're just grateful that it's been recorded so that names of individuals can be found and you can further your genealogical research. You have here things like um, a hospital record where it talks about who um, 
where these people were, were kept, some of the things that happened in the hospital. Again, this one doesn't necessarily name the individuals that were in the hospital. Some of the medical records do, but this is the type of information that was contained again. Here's something that has more details actually, land and property records. So now you do have those who were um, the farm owner, who the government um, agency was, who was getting what land kind of transactions and what have you. You also have court records. So again, when things had gone escalated beyond complaints, they went to court. <laughs> and here you have the state of Alabama, um, Calhoun County, July 1st, 1865. And there's a woman named Esther. Big, looks like it said Big Esther and her four children. Esther agreed and, and so forth. So here's a court record, very interesting record here to understand what was going on at the time and some of the legal issues that faced some of the freedmen. This record's very interesting. This is a marriage record. And the reason I say it's interesting is because I actually found this record um, because of a woman who is related to Sarah Knight. Uh, we actually were searching once the, the Freedmen's Bureau project was complete. We typed in a name, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. To search these records uh, actually came up with this marriage record for Sarah Knight and it ended up being her ancestor. And so, you know, like I said, these are the types of, of things that if you find this, oh, what a, what a glorious day it is when you find these kinds of records in this gold nugget of when this family was established legally in the United States through this marriage record. You also have records of persons and articles hired similar to labor contracts. Um, it was the way the government had documented who's working, who's not working, uh, you know, why, where are they working, if they're not working, what's going on at the time. Um, you see these handwritten. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It, some of these are challenging to read, of course. If you're not used to cursive from 1860s, uh, it, it can be a little bit difficult to decipher. But these are handwritten. Handwritten. There was some, it, it's, it just sometimes boggles my mind and, and, it, and it just it, it brings this period of history to life for me as I see the names of these people and see the handwritten documentation of these people who existed. Um, the assistant commissioner records, there are many of these and, and we'll talk about what has been um, completed by the Freedom's Bureau Project and what has not. But there are lots of correspondence that just goes back and forth between the commissioners in the different field offices and to headquarters uh, in DC. And so that, that kind of takes you through some of the records that you'll find and be able to go through as you look at some of the Freedmen's Bureau records. Now, what was the Freedmen's Bureau project? Now, that, that's kind of a different story. That was our effort to actually, that we launched on June 19th, 2015. We're at the California African American Museum. You see me there in the orange tie. <laughs> um, and we invited the world to help us take some of the records of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen's and Abandoned Lands, the Record Group 105, and index them. Meaning we wanted to transcribe the documents and actually make them available to be searchable online. And so during the course of 366 days, like I'll show you here in just a moment, we had over 120 different events, locations where people got together to actually look at the, the images that we had already digitized and type in information like names, dates, places, and put them into the Family Search database. We have a Family Search indexing program, and indexing is, is the process of taking selective information from a document, transcribing it, and putting it into a database. It's how things get into Google, for example, if you've never indexed before. But something had to be indexed in order to be searchable on Google, and that's the same on Family Search. These historical records have to be indexed in order for us to um, put them in the Family Search database and make them searchable for anyone who's gene doing genealogical research. And so through the course of, of the project, we had 120 events all around the country, including in Canada. Um, and, as, and as a result, we were able to take what started in the 1970s as a microfilming project with the National Archives and has gone on to, you know, in 2000, the Freedmen's Preservation Freedmen's Bureau Records Preservation Act that, in, that funded actually the digitization of these records and the final microfilming and things like that, um, which we completed in 2010, 
to starting June 19th with the Freedmen's Bureau project to select to index a select amount of content from the Freedmen Bureau records to a completion of the project on June 20th, 2016. So I have to applaud all those who helped with the project. Um, we finished on June 20th with exactly 366 days. Uh, there were 25,550 volunteers that uh, indexed and arbitrated 1,781,463 records. That's names of individuals. In our case, a record is a name of an individual that's listed in these records. So we've now made nearly 1.8 million names searchable online on Family Search, and we did it in just 366 days. As a result of this project, we actually presented Family Search on behalf of Family Search, myself, and Elder D. Todd Christofferson in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, presented this database to Lonnie Bunch, the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. It's the new museum in the Smithsonian, and we presented the database on a thumb drive in this lantern that represents the project. What an amazing milestone it was, and I applaud all those who were involved in the project in any way, shape, or form. But that, so that was the project, and we completed the project and made those records available. But the meat of this presentation really is how can you use the Freedmen Bureau records for genealogical research? And to answer that question, I want to show you how you can actually find the records. How you use them really is up to you. What you do with them, um, you know, how they can help you in your own research is really up to you. I can't answer that question. I, all I can do is point you to the direction of where are these records? How do you get to them? How can they be used? If you can't find them, you can't really use them, can you? So, so let's take you through the process of kind of how to find Freedmen's Bureau collections on FamilySearch.org. Like I said, the indexing pro project, the Freedmen's Bureau um, project, put these, made it so that these records are now published and available on FamilySearch.org. And so you simply, there's four steps. I'll repeat them twice. Um, you'll also have an opportunity to download this pro this presentation, so you'll have these steps in, in before you as well. And the first step is to go to FamilySearch.org and click on Search Records. The second is to browse all published collections. The third is to type Freed in the Filter by Collection name box. And the fourth is click on Records to sort the result. That will get you into these records. Now I know I just said those and I didn't illustrate, but I will illustrate these for you. So don't worry, never fear. Um, like I said, first go to FamilySearch.org. Um, that's all one word, lowercase, FamilySearch.org where you can search records. So once you come to FamilySearch.org, our, our homepage looks like this, and you can click on Search Records. If you see here, Search Records. And then once you search records, you'll come to this page. This page has, you can search for a deceased ancestor's name on the left. You can research by location on the right. But actually there's a, a little purple, um, uh, section that are, are highlighted in purple. It's not highlighted until you click on it. But you can click Browse All Published Collections at the bottom of the page, and that will take you to another page. This is the list of all the historical record collections that Family Search has. At the time that I took this screen capture, um, we had 2,155 different record collections from around the world on Family Search. And not all of them are Freedmen Bureau, <laughs> so you know. Um, we have over 5.5 billion, it may be 5.6 billion records available on Family Search. And so, in order to find those that are related with the Freedmen's Bureau project, the simplest way, instead of scrolling down through all 2,155, which are sorted in alphabetical order, the easier way is to actually filter by collection name by typing the word freed in the filter by collection name box. So you'll see here, you type in the word freed, and it all of a sudden gives you a list now of 30 collections that are available on Family Search. And if you click the word records, actually, once you get to the result, it'll change how it looks. And what you'll see now is a list of the records that have been indexed. If there is a number 
underneath the records column. Those are the number of records or number of names that are included in this collection that are searchable. So in this case, with the Virginia Freedmen's Bureau Field Office records, 1865 to 1872, there are over 834,422 names in that collection. Now there's 30 collections, and as you see on this page, these are the ones that have been indexed because they have a number under records. And the best way again to sort those is to, is to click on records once you come to this page. If you've typed freed into filter by collection name, then you come over and click records and that will actually um, sort it by, by records. And it decreases as you go. As you look here, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I actually think there may be 15, 14 um, record collections that have been published as part of the Freedmen's Bureau project or previous projects. Now if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that these have browse images. Many of these are the field office records from the different states, as you can see. The records of the assistant commissioner and records of the commissioner as well at the bottom. These have not been indexed. So one common question I have is, are all the Freedmen Bureau records indexed? The answer is no. And we, I'll tell you why, <laughs> just briefly. Um, it's because we chose, uh, as part of this project, one, to partner with the Smithsonian, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and they identified and helped us identify the, those records that had the most genealogically um, rich data, meaning names of individuals, of freedmen, freedwomen, refugees, um, whites, anybody that had the most, the documents that had the most likelihood to have names that would be searchable. And so we selected those records to be indexed. These field office records in many cases are correspondence and letters back and forth between field officers. And there may uh, every once in a while be names of freedmen or families or, or things like that. But it is much less common uh, to have names of freedmen in abundance in these records. Yes, they are. There are records and there are names in abundance in these and you can find individuals in there. But we felt for the purpose of the project in, in order to complete this in a timely manner that we would limit the records that we would actually make available so that uh, we provided what was what seemed like the most genealogically rich data first. That's not to say that these field office records will never be indexed because they may. We may choose to index them. In fact, we'd love your feedback on indexing these records. But right now, it is those 14 collections that have been indexed, and these are not. You can still browse these collections, and I'll actually show you how to do that here shortly, um, and still get the data and information that you're looking for, but they're not the same as being able to type a name for these collections. So hopefully that answers a question for that's been out there. I know I've been asked that question multiple times. So again, uh, just so to get you back to where that place was, so we can go back the steps and how to find indexed Freedmen's Bureau collections on FamilySearch.org. Go to FamilySearch.org and click on Search Records. Click Browse All Published Collections. Type Freed in the Filter by Collection name box and click on Records to sort the result. Okay. So if once you've done that, if you want to search in a single collection for a name, for example, you want to look in the claim records which we saw on the results page had actually names in them. Here's how you would go about doing that, okay? So again, we're back to our page. We've typed in Freed in the filter by collection name. We've sorted it by records, and now we're clicking on the Freeman Bureau claim records. And you come to this page where you're able to put in a first name and a last name. Those are the only criteria that you're able to search within the Freedmen Bureau records is first name and last name. You're not able in any of the collections to um, search by place specifically. Uh, we do a broader search and then you can narrow the results once they come up, but we don't necessarily um, uh, provide right there a place search. You can search with the life event. If you wanted to add a marriage, residence, death, things like that, that do have places in them. But the default and what's, the, what's simply available on this page are the first name and last name. 
So, for example, I'm going to look at Tom Baines. That's how I found that record um, we talked about earlier and click search. And here I come up with a result for Tom Baines. It's the result we saw earlier. So I was not able before, you know, I, um, you know, before the Freedmen's Bureau project, I was not able to find any additional information on Tom Baines. But during the project, someone indexed this claim record. And as I look at the details, I, you know, click on that, click on the details, and I'm able to look at the image, and I'm able to zoom in on the image. I see the name of the claimant, the amount due, the voucher signed and returned, the money received, by whom identified, and here he is. Tom Baines in Vicksburg, Warren, Mississippi, on the 15th of January of 1870, received a pension. So that is my great, great grandfather, <laughs> Tom Baines, um, or Thomas Baines, that's listed in the Freedmen Bureau records. So thank you to me. I'm th actually thankful to, to the person who indexed this record because now we have it. But that's how you would go about searching in an individual collection. You'd simply open the collection that has been indexed and type in the name and then filter and look at the results. One of the things I wanted to make you aware of is the vast resources available on our Family Search Wiki as well. And so, for example, if you want to look and learn more about these claim records, you click on, again, the claim record. And instead of typing in here the name, let's just say you want to learn more about what these types of records, claim records from the Freedmen's Bureau contain. You can go to our wiki by clicking on the learn more button or learn more link. And there it'll take you actually to United States Freedmen's Bureau, Freedmen's Bureau claim records. And it'll talk to you about what's the collection. It'll show you some of the collection content. It'll show you some of the roles from NARA. Again, you see that it were part of record group 105. Um, it shows you that the states that were involved in some of these claim records, uh, again, like it shows you the register of indigent persons eligible for rations that was in some of the claim records. It tells you what information might be found in that record, name, date of record, birthplace, residence, age, marriage date and place may be in these records. It, what can the record tell you here? Um, how you search the collection, again, kind of taking you back to where you came from. And if you found who you were looking for, what to do next, or if you haven't found them, what to do next. And so this is a great resource that Family Search has put together to uh, enable you to continue to look at some of these records and, and go a little bit deeper into this content. Now, you're also able to browse images in here. So for example, um, we have, you see here, the record that I showed you earlier, the marriage record. But let me show you how you would browse an image instead of searching by a name. So let's go through here. And I'm looking now, again, I'm at my, uh, the filter by collection on Freed. I'm at the Freedman Bureau Marriages. And I actually go ahead and click on it. And instead of now looking for a name, um, I'm actually going to browse through the images, the 3,564 images, marriage um, images that we have. And that'll take me actually to each state. So you'll see these states, Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, D.C., Florida, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Tennessee, Virginia, Washington, and unknown. So you can actually go through. And I'm going to look in Mississippi. And once I click on Mississippi, I can actually browse through and see the names of all those who were married, at least the last name, the surname, of those who are married in the state of Mississippi that are contained in the Freedmen Bureau records. And in this case, I chose Knight, which was Melvania's relative. She just wanted to check and see who that Knight was. I'm able to check on George. And once I click on George, I'm able to see this record. And this is the marriage license of George and Sarah Knight and Melvania Knight is the descendant of them. So very, very cool to be able to find things this way. There's so many ways. Now there is a way to search across multiple collections and this is where things really get good <laughs> or really, at least really fun and exciting for me. For example, um, we've created this website which is discoverfreedmen.org, discoverfreedmen.org. It can be lowercase or uppercase, doesn't matter. Still take you there. And on the page, you can actually scroll down to search for an ancestor. 
And here, for example, I have, I'm a Reed, and my grandfather was Tom Reed. I have all these Toms in my family, just if you didn't know. Um, but I also have an Ed Reed in my family. And so in searching for an ancestor, I click Ed Reed. I click the little magnifying glass to see all the results. And this page on discoverfreedman.org shows you that there are 829 results for Ed Reed. Notice some of them are spelling variations and what have you. That's okay. That's what we look for and we understand in genealogical research. The names might not always match. But here we have Ed Reed and you have these 829 results. And I scroll down and I'm just looking. I knew that my people were actually in Alabama. And so I decided to click on and look at the Ed Reed in Alabama in Jackson, Calhoun, Alabama, and it looks like a Freedmen's Bureau labor contracts indenture or apprenticeship record. And it takes me to this and I'm able to see on family search. So these records that are on discoverfreedmen.org actually are connected to what's in family search. And so you go there, you can actually click on and see the original document. In this case, the document is pretty dark, so I had to try and lighten it. And I tried to see as much as I could the information about Ed Reed on this document. Now, in this case, I don't believe this is my um, great grandfather, but I was able to have another research point, another tool to help me. So you can see all results if you go back to discoverfreedman.org. You, you can click on an individual result or you can click on see all results. So see all results comes here. And this is an amazing thing. Family Search has made it so that it only searches through discoverfreedman.org. You can search only the indexed collections. We remember we saw those 14 collections that had been indexed as part of the Freedmen's Bureau project and previous projects. These are the collections that are being searched, including the Freedmen's Bank records, which is just a different set, wasn't included as part of the Freedmen's Bureau, but was still um, helpful in, in finding uh, individuals during this time period. And so here are the collections that have been searched and, and therefore you, you're able to um, go through and look at some of these search results. So, so hopefully that's been helpful to you. Um, in this presentation, I, I hope I've been able to share with you what was the Freedmen's Bureau, as you know, that organization between 1865 and 1872 established by the United States government to help those who are, were transitioning from slavery to freedom and were trying to recover after the war. It was officially known as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. And the records kept during that time were everything from rations, labor contracts, court records, complaints, marriage records, education records, hospital records, all kinds of records. The project was to actually take these records, which had been digitized by the National Archives as part of Record Group 105, and make some of them searchable online by name. We did that in 366 days, resulting in 1,781,463 names discovered as part of the Freedmen's Bureau project and made them searchable online. And how you can use these records for genealogical research? Well, you can search individual collections by name. You can browse rec individual collections and narrow things down to, to individual areas. Or you can go to discoverfreedmen.org and search across multiple collections. So I hope that helps you in your genealogical research. It's been a pleasure sharing this information. If you have uh, any questions whatsoever, you can find me online. I'm, I'm very readily available on Facebook. But I thank you for joining. I appreciate your time today and, and have, hope you have great luck in searching for your ancestors in the Freedmen's Bureau records. Thanks.